Are you a .NET developer struggling with cold starts on Lambda, trying to build web applications and reduce the impact of your application starting up? This is the video for you. Lambda snap start for .NET. Let's get into it. Ah, the Lambda cold start. One of the most commonly touted drawbacks of building with Lambda. And if you're a .NET developer and you've tried to build something with AWS Lambda, you will inevitably have come across a cold start. Us .NET developers, as well as the Java developers out there, seem to have been hit particularly hard with the old cold start. And last year at reInvent, AWS announced Lambda Snap Start, a way to try and reduce the impact of cold starts on your web applications. Now that is great for those Java developers out there, isn't it? Well, for Java. Us .NET developers still in the same situation. Now, it's important to point out in a production workload, Lambda cold starts only affect a really small number of requests, but when they do happen, they are still an issue. That's why I was incredibly excited to see yesterday that AWS have announced support for Snapstart for us .NET developers, yeah. I thought Snapstar would only come for Python because, well, Python's a very popular runtime in Lambda. I did not expect to see it for .NET. So this is both incredibly exciting for us .NET developers. This is going to be the video for you because this is exactly what you're going to learn about today. Let's get into it. So if you're new to Lambda and Snapstar, it's probably really important to understand exactly what is happening when you enable Snapstar in your Lambda functions. So this is the typical execution lifecycle for a Lambda function. When a request hits your function, the execution environment gets created for your code to execute. Your code is downloaded, the .NET runtime is started up, and then your application code is initialized. That period of things there is what is known as a cold start. And after all that has happened, then your request is actually handled. But when you turn on snap start, this differs ever so slightly. At the point in which you deploy your function, all of this happens. So all this initialization happens at deploy time. After all that has happened, a cache of that running execution environment is created and it's cached somewhere, which means when an invoke actually comes into your Lambda function, all that needs to happen for your code to run is the cache gets restored and then the request gets handled. So your initialization, your cold start, if you will, is just this section here, the cache being restored. All this heavy lifting that happens typically when your function gets invoked is shifted to deploy time, which means all of that has already happened before your code gets invoked, which in theory should save a huge percentage of time during the actual cold start phase. And to work through this example today to enable snap start for a Lambda function, we're actually going to work through using a sample that AWS have on GitHub. If you're not familiar with this repo, this is a repository developed by AWS, and it's used to benchmark all of the different variations of running .NET on Lambda. And what I actually want to use is an entire ASP.NET application running inside Lambda. So there's some benchmarks in here for running a minimal API on Lambda with native AOT enabled, but obviously native AOT brings about its own sets of complexity. Not all of the packages in the world support being compiled to a native binary. So in a lot of cases, native AOT isn't actually an option for you to build with. So I want to take the .NET A minimal API example and deploy that to Lambda Snapstar to see exactly how that will work. So to do that, the first thing you're going to need to do is make sure you're using the latest version of the Lambda Core NuGet package. At the time of me recording this, that is 2.5.0. If you're watching this at a later date, just make sure you're using something later than 2.5.0. And actually, to enable Lambda Snapstar, all you need to do is actually turn it on inside Lambda. You don't actually need to make any code changes to turn on Lambda Snapstar. Now, to get the full benefits of Snapstar, there's some stuff you can do in your code, but to turn it on, you don't actually need to change your application code. This example here is using AWS SAM as its deployment mechanism. And you'll notice there's these two additional properties in the YAML here. Now, to use Snapstar, you need to be using aliases and versions inside Lambda. I've got another video on my YouTube channel that talks more about using aliases and versions. I'll put a link to that in the description below. Just know that aliases and versions allow you to version the deployment of your Lambda function. And Snapstart gets applied whenever you create a new version. 
Now, something to be really, really, really careful of if you're trying this out. When you enable Snapstar, make sure you're not invoking the latest version of your Lambda function. You will have an alias, maybe you call your alias prod, and you will still have the dollar latest version of your Lambda function. If you invoke the dollar latest version, you are still going to get the non Snapstar enabled function. So if you're trying this out, and it doesn't quite work as you might expect, just make sure you're invoking the alias and not the latest version. I will show you that when we actually get into the AWS console after deploying this. So in terms of turning Snapstar on, all you need to do is enable Snapstar for published versions and make sure you configure an alias. Here, we're setting AWS SAM up to automatically create a new version and then automatically publish that new version to an alias called prod. That is exactly what's happening here. And that is all you need to do to enable Snapstar. Now, before I started recording this video, I just pre-deployed a version of the Lambda function just to show you exactly what is happening. So when you deploy this now, you will actually see if you go to the configuration, you've got Snapstar enabled on published versions. Here, I'm in the latest version of the Lambda function. You can see if I was to test this Lambda function here, this is going to test it using the non Snapstar enabled version. So I'm going to run that. That's probably going to take roughly 1.2, 1.3 seconds. The init duration, okay, less than a second. Great, better than we thought. To test the Snapstar enabled version, make sure you go to the aliases and you'll see I've got an alias named the same as whatever it was that you configured in your auto publish alias. If I go into this prod alias, and then try and test the function. Here I am now testing the Snapstar enabled version of the function. So I've hit that and you'll see now I don't actually get an init duration. Previously I had an init duration of 700 milliseconds. Here I just have a restore duration. And you'll notice already that restore duration is about 50% faster than not having Snapstar enabled. So even with this single one-off test, you can still see there's about a 50% performance improvement just by turning Snapstar on, which is frankly fantastic. Now, I must just point out when I first started testing this out, I did see some really odd numbers. The first time I started doing this in EU West 1, I saw restore durations that were a lot higher than the init duration. Once I started running some load through the function, that number got lower and lower and lower and lower. So if you're testing this for the very first time and you hit your function for the very first time and the restore duration is longer than the init duration, don't worry about that immediately. What I'd recommend is running some load through the function and then starting to look at the numbers. Now, having Snapstar enabled is all well and good. You get that cached version of your started up application. Your application has been initialized. It's ready to go but there are some additional things you can do. You can actually hook into that before snapshot. So in this initialization of your application code, you can run some custom code. Same as when your application gets restored, you can also run some custom code using what is called hooks. To have a look exactly how you do that, remember this is an ASP.NET application. So in the function.cs, you've got the actual startup of your ASP.NET web app, as you would probably expect to see. You're configuring some services, you're configuring logging, you're mapping your endpoints, you're doing all the things you would expect to see in an ASP.NET application. And this is great, right? What you will get when you're using the version 2.5.0 of the Amazon.Lambda core package is you get these additional methods. You've got register before snapshot and in real time, we're noticing bugs in my code. You've got register after restore. This allows you to register a method that is going to run both before the snapshot is taken and after the restore happens. What can you do with this? This is where you might want to pre-configure any S secrets. Maybe you need to download some configuration from Secrets Manager. Maybe you're going to initialize your database connections. Maybe you're going to as we're going to in this example, actually prime our AWS SDKs. So you'll see before the snapshot happens, I'm calling this before checkpoint method. That's defined just down at the bottom of this same code file. This is just a static async method that's going to actually call this prime method on my data access layer. What that's actually going to do behind the scenes, that's simply just going to make a describe table call 
to DynamoDB. Now, this is a handy little thing you can do with all of the AWS SDKs. So they set up that connection with the AWS APIs, things like TLS handshakes, all that kind of time consuming stuff. You can do all of that during the initialization phase. The other thing I'm also doing here is so you can see this in action is I'm actually going to log a message to my console saying priming database connection and priming complete. Equally, I can also do things after restore. When might you want to use after restore? Maybe you need to refresh your sequence. You need to make sure that actually this snapshot might have been sat around for a little while. Maybe the connection has changed. Maybe the API keys that you need to make a call to a third party have changed. So in the after restore, you may load some more additional information. And just remember, you do register before a snapshot, register after restore, and this allows you to run code before and after the snapshot is taken and restored. If you go off to your terminal now, you can actually go off and deploy this. So I'm going to run a SAM build command, as you would always, building your application works no differently now than it did previously. Once this has actually gone off and built, you can then run a SAM deploy command. Now, one thing to be aware of is that your deploys will take quite a bit longer. They'll take longer because at the point of deploy, that new version needs to be created, the function needs to be initialized, the snapshot needs to be taken. After all that has happened, the deploy will complete. So once that SAM build is complete, I'm gonna run a SAM deploy command and then I'm gonna pause the video and come back in just a moment. I just thought I'd pop back in because this deploy is actually happening as I speak. You can see the CloudFormation live logs, this is actually being deployed. And if whilst this is being deployed, if you go over to CloudWatch and your CloudWatch log group for this Lambda function, and actually have a look at the latest log group. So you can see I've got a log here for 1313. That is right now when I'm recording the video. You'll actually see the logs for that initialization. So you can see I've got the priming database connection message, and then I've got the complete message. These are the same messages you saw in the actual code that's running before a checkpoint. Inside my data access prime method, I've got the priming database connection and complete. So you can actually see these logs in real time whilst your code is actually deploying. This is actually quite useful for working out exactly what is happening. And if things happen to go wrong during that initialization phase, and actually you'll see as I finish talking, that update is complete. That has now successfully deployed. Now, by way of actually testing this, as I said earlier, one of the things I've seen at least right now with Snapstart is that it seems to get better the more load you put through the function. If you just do one-off invokes here and there, it may be not be as performant as you might expect. So to actually demonstrate just how much quicker this is, I'm actually going to run a load test. And this repo actually has a load test utility built in. I need to set the API URL environment variable to be the endpoint of my API. And then if I go into the load test folder, I can actually run a load test using artillery from my local machine. And this is going to set off and absolutely batter that API endpoint with a whole bunch of requests. And as you actually look at the requests as they flow through, artillery will actually give you real time results. And if I scroll back up to this first batch of results, you'll see the P99 there is about two seconds, which isn't really great. But we'll have a look at that in just a minute. And the P95 is down at around a second. To have a look at this is a bit to have a look at this at a bigger scale, I'm going to use this CloudWatch log insights query. Now, this query is something that's in the AWS documentation. Now, this CloudWatch log insights query is something that's in the AWS documentation. I'll put a link to it in the description below. This actually allows you to analyze how well your function is doing with Snapstar enabled. And if I run this query for the last five minutes, I can see that there are some results that have been matched. And what this will actually give you is a breakdown of the performance of your function, both when there is a cold start, in this case, a cold start is that restore of the cached Lambda function. And you've got the warm invokes, which gives you the actual baseline performance of your Lambda function. And as you might expect, once a function is warm, you get pretty decent performance, consistent double digit millisecond response time. That's what you might expect for a .NET application communicating with DynamoDB. As we start to run this query more, you can see that the cold start numbers are still pretty high. The P50 cold start here is about a second. Now, you might think that is not quite as impressive as you might think. Frankly, you might look at that and think that's basically just the same as not using Snapstar. So I finished recording this video and thought, actually, it's only fair that I give a direct comparison 
from that Snapstar enabled function to the exact same function deployed without Snapstar. So here it is. Here is the .NET 8 ASP.NET minimal API deployed to Lambda just using latest, no Snapstar, the exact same configuration apart from Snapstar has been turned off. And the numbers actually in this case are better. You are better off not using Snapstar in this scenario because the when there is a cold start, there are both less cold starts and the maximum cold start is about 1.9 seconds. You remember from the Snapstar enabled video, the maximum cold start was over two seconds. Given that Snapstar was announced yesterday, the day before I'm recording this video, my expectation is that that will get better over time. And in fact, I'm going to record another video in a few weeks time once this has had time to bed in, once it has had time to spread around all the different regions and actually do another analysis of the performance. One thing I learned when I was at AWS is that when these new things get released for Lambda, for some of the serverless services, they do take a little while for the impact to fully kick in. You'll remember when .NET 8 first became available on Lambda, the performance of .NET 8 was actually worse than .NET 6 for a period of time. And then over time, .NET 8 got better. So take this video with a little bit of a pinch of salt. Take away the things you can do to actually leverage Snapstar inside your application code. The way you can hook into the before snapshot and after restore, the way you actually turn on Snapstar using aliases and versions, and then actually run some real load through your function and compare the results. Looking at the pricing for Snapstar, it looks like it's going to come in at roughly $4 per month per function. So it may be something where it is actually beneficial to run an entire ASP.NET application on Lambda, what will be commonly known as a Lambda lift. That way you're only paying for one function per month with Snapstar enabled. And you're also likely to see less cold starts running a bigger application on Lambda. So that's Lambda Snapstart for .NET. It's released, it's available today. I would love to see in the comments your experience with turning on Snapstar. Have you seen a similar thing that I have where the performance actually isn't exactly perfectly what you might expect? Or are you seeing mind-blowing performance? please let me know in the comments. I must add a really quick caveat. I ran them numbers earlier today before I started recording this video. I saw a roughly 57% performance improvement to not using snaps. I have seen numbers today where the performance is better. It just so happens that the exact time I'm recording this video, the performance was worse. Now, again, Snapstart was only released yesterday. So let's see what things are happening in a couple of weeks. I'd love to see your comments in the description below on any social medias. Please reach out and tell me about your experience with Lambda and .NET. But with that, I'll see you all next time.